heard that bees are in peril. In the US, they've lost around a third of their managed honeybee colonies every year since 2006. And it's a similar story in the UK and in Europe. It's a problem because one in three mouthfuls that we eat is pollinated by bees. So they're part of our global food system. These bees are pollinating almonds in California, where 80% of the world's almonds come from. Now, without these honeybees, the trees won't bear any nuts. So you can see pollinators and humans are totally interconnected. So when news of the honeybee's demise hit the headlines, people wanted to know how they could help. One response was a huge rise in urban beekeeping. Five years ago, the British Beekeeping Association had 10,000 members. Now it's 24,000, and many of them live in cities. Traditionally, beekeepers have been male, retired, and bearded, and living out in the sticks, <laughs> and managing their hives for the honey. But now there are more people like myself beekeeping. So female, slightly younger, professional, living in cities, and whose motivation is the bees and the environment. Other new beekeepers are these people working in the city and tending their hives in their lunch hour, or inner-city youths beekeeping after school. And here are some people who are on a beekeeping course at an urban wildlife park after a long day in the office. Urban Bees, the organization I set up with my partner, has trained some of these new beekeepers in the capital. But people all over the UK are doing it. And globally, there are beehives in major cities, including New York, Paris, Melbourne, Tokyo, Toronto. When you become a beekeeper, it's the start of a journey, a journey that makes you view life differently. And it changes our relationship with nature. Through bees, we learn to take a closer look around us, and they show us new ways to think and behave, sometimes with profound effects that you wouldn't expect. At Charlton Manor Primary School in South London, beekeeping has dramatically improved the behavior of some of the most unruly pupils. When a swarm of bees arrived at the school gates a few years ago, the head teacher, Tim Baker, was determined that his pupils were going to learn and respect and understand bees, not to be afraid of them like most of the staff seemed to be. So he went on a beekeeping course. He installed a hive, which the kids painted. And from the start, he got some of the most disruptive pupils into bee suits. And he found there was a miraculous change in their behavior. They were no longer throwing chairs at teachers and wrecking classrooms. After being around the bees, they were much calmer. So when I was researching Bees in the City, a book about urban beekeeping, I went to visit the school, and I spoke to one of those troublesome eight-year-olds and asked him what impact he thought the bees had had. And he told me, I'm much better in class now. I concentrate more. The bees make me peaceful and calm. He didn't really understand why that was, but the head teacher had a theory. He said it was because the boys had to be calm around the hive or else they'd get stung. It was as if the bees, it was as if they were showing respect to the bees and the bees were showing respect back. He also said it was probably the first time these boys had ever found anything at school that they enjoyed and were good at. So it's a really nice story. And bees also break down barriers. When you put on a bee suit, you know, we're all equal, whether you're the teacher, the good kid, the bad kid. And it's the same in business. You can have company directors beekeeping alongside office juniors. At Global Generation, a charity Urban Bees works with, bees have engaged the young people and changed their ideas about what's nerdy and what's cool. For me, I've learned that honeybees are just one of thousands of pollinators, including bumblebees, solitary bees, butterflies, and moths. They don't make honey for us, 
but they're all incredibly important pollinators. And like honeybees, they're all under threat from changing land use and lack of forage. We've wiped out 97% of our wildflower-rich grasslands in the countryside since the Second World War. We used to have 3 million hectares, now we're down to about 100,000. This is because of intensive farming practices and urbanization. So there's a great opportunity for cities to become the new countryside, if you like. When I walk down a London street now, I see the trees. I never really noticed them before, except they're bare in the winter and, and green in the summer. But now I see them all as urban insect food. And the same with flowers. They're not just simply a splash of color. They're an insect supermarket. The flowering trees and plants need pollinators to reproduce. And the pollinators need the flowers, nectar and pollen. For bees, it's their only food. The poet Khalil Gibran beautifully explains this relationship. To the bee, a flower is a fountain of life. And to the flower, the bee is a messenger of love. So these pollinated plants can bear fruit, seeds, berries, and nuts, which are all food for other urban dwellers, including birds and small mammals and even us. So bees are a great ambassador for nature. They make you aware that we share our cities with many other creatures, not just human neighbors, and we're all linked. By 2050, 75% of the human population will live in cities, and there's a growing debate about how do we make our cities more resilient. Well, I believe that by redefining cities as places where we live in nature and we care for pollinators, that we can achieve that resilience. So my vision of a city is one with a more plentiful supply and choice of food for bees and other pollinators all year round. That insect supermarket I mentioned, well, some of the aisles are looking pretty bare, especially our rooftops. You know, practically none of them offer anything for our pollinators in the way of food or habitat. Yet a large percentage of our cities are rooftops, 38% of Manhattan, for example. And gardens, too, can be bee deserts. In London, they account for a quarter of the land, but there's a trend to cover them in decking and paving. So we're losing the equivalent of two and a half Hyde Parks a year of greenery. Architects, developers, and landscape gardeners all need to think about forage when they design and build our cities. For example, planting trees like hazel and alder, whose catkins provide early pollen for our bees, and creating living roofs on new and old buildings. And a patchwork of bee-friendly gardens and parks and urban roofs can be joined up by verges and tree pits and window boxes, all planted with forage to create rivers of flowers meandering through our city streets. But we also need places where our pollinators can nest and breed, like in bits of decaying wood or piles of old leaves. This needs to be in parts of cities that we allow to grow wild. And we can help solitary bees by making these bee hotels from bundles of hollow bamboo canes, which they can check into and, and lay their eggs in. If the cities work better for pollinators, they work better for us, too. Research shows that connecting people with nature hugely benefits human health and mental well-being. Here's a beekeeping group who, after tending their hives for a year, are, look, are harvesting... Sorry. This is a beekeeping group who, after tending their hives for a year, harvested the honey. It was an uplifting and emotional experience for them. They didn't know each other before they started beekeeping. Now some of them are firm friends. This is an example of how... This is one example of how bees can bring together diverse groups of people. And there are many others. For example, in King's Cross, the largest building development in Europe, the Honey Club is bringing together young people 
with new businesses moving into the area through bee-related events, such as cooking with honey or guerrilla gardening. Pollinator cities would also be more resilient to flooding. Just one tree can absorb a thousand gallons of water. And a green rooftop like this one, seven stories up in London, can retain most of the rainwater that falls on it. They're also less polluted and more aesthetically pleasing to live in. So this is where my journey as a beekeeper has led me. Eight years ago, I went on a beekeeping course, and I put on a bee suit for the very first time. And now I see cities in a completely different light. In reshaping the cityscape for bees and other pollinators with urban meadows and green roofs, I believe that because we're all inextricably linked, that we're not just ensuring their survival, but we're guaranteeing our own future. I'd like to leave you with a quote from John Muir, a giant of the conservation movement in the US. He says, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. Thank you.